Good evening, Ruchim Abayim Avotai. Welcome to another edition of our Thursday night's class. Tonight's class, somebody sponsored anonymously. I don't know myself who it is. Um, and the text that I got was sponsored anonymously in a way of saying thank you to Hashem for everything He does for me. So I thought that was very nice. I'll add on to his thank you, Keni Ten Ochen Yosif, whoever it is. It should always be happy and health and healthy and have many reasons to be thankful. I understand that. So I titled tonight's class, A Journey to Greatness. I, the word greatness is up for interpretation and every, if we had to take a poll amongst thousands of people, you'd probably get thousands of answers. Each person defines greatness on his own perception. So I'm not here to go down that road of what the uh, correct yeah. translation to being great is. That uh, maybe should be done some other time. I want to talk about the journey, because sometimes the journey is actually more than the outcome. Definitely when it comes to a Jewish perspective. The foundation of the idea that a journey is more important than an outcome is because unlike, we've yeah. used this, we've said this in different contexts in many previous classes over the years, unlike let's say the corporate world, that your performance evaluation is outcome-based, meaning you can be at work instead of eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, but if you don't perform, you're gonna lose your job at one point. By God, it's not like that. God doesn't evaluate the outcome. He actually evaluates the journey. It's not your job to finish, to succeed. But at the same time, that doesn't give you the cheap way out of saying, okay, if I don't have to succeed, so I don't have to try. Um, Chafetz Chaim briefly said, uh, proves this from many places. Amongst them, one of his places that he proves it from is in the prayer that we say when we do a siyum on a masechet. We say, Anu ratzim vehim ratzim. We run, meaning we put time and effort into something, and the nations of the world do. We go and get reward, and they go and don't get reward. If anything, it seems the opposite. One who learns in coal gets $84 a week in Lakewood Yeshiva right now. Hopefully soon they'll be getting a raise, but that's currently the salary. Um, now most of them learn about 80 hours a week, so they get paid about a dollar an hour. Um, and if you work in the corporate world, especially if you have an executive job, you definitely earn upwards of $100 an hour. So it seems like, they go and they get reward. And, and we go and don't get reward, it seems like. So the Chafetz Chaim says an interesting thing. He says, there's also another quote there, together with this. I know, same idea. We work and they work. And again, we get rewarded, they don't get rewarded. And he says, it's not, it doesn't seem to be the way it is. So the Chavetz Chaim says exactly this idea. He says that by HaKadosh Baruch Hu, by God, your reward is for your effort, not for your outcome. Your outcome is a bonus. And the bonus primarily is for you that you feel satisfied because you feel like you got some sort of outcome, which is a big pitfall. Many people don't feel they got the outcome and as a result give up on making the effort. If they would understand that the goal is not the outcome, the goal is the effort, they would never give up. Remember that, that's a big game changer in life. Um, that's the only way, continuing what we said last week, to rationalize the whole Elul and Rosh Hashanah Kippur, because we do play holy for about 40 days on and off, more or less, each one in his way, and then business back to usual. Uh, it wouldn't make any sense if not for the journey being the goal. So even though business back to usual, unfortunately, later, but the journey itself was valid and valuable, and as, as a result of that, that makes sense. Um, so the Chavetz Chaim says if somebody would work and put in a lot of effort but not produce, his examples actually with clothing, if somebody went to a tailor and hired him to make him a suit and he spent many, many hours with the suit but never, finished, never made a suit, you're not going to pay him for his time because you ordered a suit. You didn't order him working many hours. And if he had a way to do it in five minutes, that's perfectly fine with you. It doesn't make a difference. You just need what to wear. And, not, and you're paying to have what to wear. What it takes to get there doesn't make a difference to you. Same idea, 
in pretty much everything in life. You don't go, you know, if you went into a restaurant and ordered dinner and then got a check without the meal, and they tell you the chef worked very hard but burnt all the food, I don't think you would pay the check. Uh, rightfully so. Because you didn't pay for the chef to work hard. You paid to have what to eat. And if you didn't have what to eat, then goodbye. It's like that in everything in life. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it's not like that. We pay for the... He pays us for the effort. Or He looks for us to make the effort. What ends up happening? Who cares? Because you are not who cares, you already succeeded. You made an effort, you already succeeded. To the point that Chazal say that if a person had the intentions in doing a mitzvah and had something come up along the way and he wasn't able to do the mitzvah, God considers it as if he did it. We once said over from Chaim Kanievsky that he said an unbelievable chidush, a practical chidush, meaning chidush and halacha, a way of thinking. He said, if somebody had plans to wake up early in the morning to go learn or to go pray or whatever, and he set an alarm clock, and he woke up in the morning, but the Yitzhah got the best of him, and he shut off the alarm clock and went right back to sleep. So he's not going to get reward for learning, because he didn't end up learning. But he's going to get reward for 12 hours of preparing himself to go learn. And the preparation for a mitzvah is greater than the mitzvah itself. So his intentions when he went to bed didn't go in vain. He actually accomplished a whole lot just by the thought of tomorrow is going to be a better day. And the same thing in everything. And that, therefore, when somebody during Elul or Shana Kippur says this coming year I'm going to do better, even if he doesn't end up doing much better, he accomplished an unbelievable accomplishment in Shammai. Because just the intention, just the thought, the train of thought along the way was already a huge success when it comes to the way Hashem looks at the world. So, we see from here that the journey is an extremely important thing. The problem is, is that in order to go on a journey, you have to have a motivation. If I tell you get into a car for 12 hours and drive to nowhere, there's actually a version of torture, it was literal, that was used in interrogation tactics in dictatorship countries that didn't entail inflicting physical pain on somebody. It entailed giving them meaningless tasks. The one who actually invented this was Paro. He was the first one who invented this idea. This is the, one of the greatest levels of making somebody suffer. Um, Paro had the people build in Pitom and Ramset because it was a, meaningly, a, a meaningless task. Whenever they thought they built something, it sunk. And they never got anywhere with it. And that's the ultimate way of breaking somebody's spirit completely. Paro invented this idea. Later on, historically, in many dictatorships, this was utilized. The, they had people that they wanted to break in one way or the other, whether it was for the purpose of interrogation or just outright evil, uh, do meaningless things for the purpose of breaking them, because that'll break one's spirit. So if I tell you to go into a car for 12 hours with no destination and no purpose, and you decide to try it anyway, every minute of those 12 hours are going to feel like living hell. It's going to be total torture. But if I tell you to go in a car for 12 hours, and at the end of the 12 hours you're going to come to one of the nicest uh, nature places in the world and have a really, really pleasant uh, vacation, then is 12 hours in a car pleasant? No, definitely not. But you won't suffer the whole way, or you'll find ways to make the best of the way. You may even put on some music, do this, do that, keep yourself busy somehow, talk on the phone, I don't know what. And it won't be the end of the world. Why? Because there's a goal. You're trying to get somewhere. So a journey really means that you need some sort of motivation in order to go on a journey in the first place. If you have some, some motivation to be on a journey, then the journey will last, you'll actually do it, and it'll also be a, somewhat of a pleasant ride, we'll call it. If there's no incentive to be on the journey, then either you won't go on it in the first place, or even if you go on it, you'll resent it and as a result quit very quickly. So if you want to have a journey to succeed, to accomplish something towards coming to God on Rosh Hashanah with something positive, then there has to be a purpose to go on that journey. So let's take our own little journey here to see if we can find the meaning to a journey. In the Sefer Chut HaMashulash, HaChodesh Resh Zayin, it talks about Rav Kivege. Rav Kivege Zetzal uh, founded a hospital. Kivege was a Gaon Olam in Torah. Gaon Olam in Torah, there's no way to describe 
nothing that we can relate to in his great mind, what a genius he was in Torah. And besides for learning, he felt that there was a need to also do chesed, to do fathers. And one of the many ways that Rabbi Kivega did chesed was in the town of Pozna that he lived, he founded a Jewish hospital. Years later, the Tzanzarov did the same thing after World War II in Netanya and Israel. He opened the hospital, Anyado, I think it's called. Um, it's uh, to benefit those who un unfortunately aren't well. But not only did he found the hospital and arrange the money to build it and to get it up and running, he was actively involved. And his active involvement in the hospital, that means he was giving up from his learning time. The big Gaon Olam, with all his tshuvot and chidushim and agaot and, and halacha, and, excuse me, and gemara and, and other things, gave up on all the Gaonut, on time from all his ingenious learning, just for the sake of this thing. And on a daily basis, it's brought down over there in the Sefer, he used to go visit the sick people in the hospital. He would go visit Biku Cholim. But not just randomly visit. He would take interest in each and every one, as if he was the doctor. He would take interest in each patient's situation. Is it getting better? Are they treating him right? Is he feeling better? Kirege wasn't a doctor. And, and he didn't play he was. But it was a care. It was a compassion towards human life and towards people that are suffering that made him take this interest. And, but what could he do? He's not a doctor. He can't treat them. He can't help them. So number one, the fact alone that somebody took interest in you is already a step. It also makes a person feel good. So that alone is accomplishment. But Abki Vega took it further. You know, the Rambam writes in Yechot Biku Cholim, we think that Biku Cholim means uh, chocolate baskets. Uh, I'm sorry to break you the news. Not only is that not Biku Cholim, it's probably Tzal Bali Chaim. Here's a person who's sick with an IV in on a strict diet and you bring him chocolate that he can't eat. So his eyes should come out. The whole thing is, it's just we don't think before we do, we just do. And we have good intentions, we mean well. But uh, it, it really makes no sense. It, 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 it's, that's not Biku Cholim. So the Ramam writes a bunch of criteria of what Biku Cholim is. Lina, the after Sukkot, we're going to give a class on Biku Cholim. We should never need it, we should never know. But uh, for many reasons, being that we're Sephardic and we like superstitions, it happens to be that the poskim bring down that it's gulaf, not to be sick, is to be mekayem the mitzvah Biku Cholim. So, why? Because when you do Biku Cholim according to the halacha, then whatever it means, you take one sixtieth of the sickness of the person, so then in whatever that means, you're already sick, so then you don't have sicknesses after that. Um, but the real reason is because the mitzvah and the Torah would be nice to know how to keep it properly. But uh, Ramam has many criteria in Hilchot Biku Cholim. Amongst the many things that a person has to do in order to do the mitzvah Biku Cholim is to pray for the sick person. If somebody went to visit his friend in the hospital and he visited and was nice and uh, let's even say had a few words of encouragement, brought a gift, did everything. It seems like on paper he did, he's a hero. Did everything as beautiful as could be. But he didn't say a prayer that the person should get better. According to the Rama, it's mashma. He didn't do the mitzvah b'ikul cholim. He wasn't yotzei the mitzvah. Because the chedek of the ikam of the mitzvah b'ikul cholim is to actually pray for the chole. So Rabbi Kivege would go on a daily basis to the hospital. He would and check on each and every patient. He would pray individually for each and every patient that they should get better. Uh, now it's known that Rabbi Kivege's prayers uh, worked. They had a big power in Shamaim, a holy mouth, and a big tzaddik, and a tamid chacham. Ritzon yireyav yaseh, Hashem does the will of those who fear him. So obviously his prayers in Shamaim made a roshim, made an impact. So, Kivega one day uh, wrote to his son, Abshalem Ege. This was brought down in the Sefer Kol Mehoran Shal Yisrael, in the first chapter, page Shin Mem Dalet that uh, he was asked to pray for a sick woman named Sarah Bat Rivka. Okay, it was known to have so much compassion for the people that are sick, building a hospital, going to visit, praying for the sick people. Somebody wasn't well, they asked him to pray for this person. And he writes to his son that 
it seems like his son was the one who asked him for this. Hitpalalti ba'ada v'lo ne'eneti. I prayed for her, and my prayer wasn't answered. I feel like he was able to feel in Shemayim if his prayer did the job or not. Since I prayed for her, my prayer wasn't answered. Didn't succeed. And then Rukhi Vega writes a few words. Ulai yesh ta'ut pashimot. Maybe there's a mistake in the name. That's not really her name. Rukhi Vega was so sure about his prayers that if it would be the right name, that it would have been, she would have been healthy. Unbelievable thing. So his son wrote back to him that, yeah, it's a mistake. By mistake, they gave the wrong mother's name. And he gave him the right mother's name. And then Rabbi Kivega writes back to his son, I prayed, right? Remember, originally he said, He prayed for Sarah. So then when he writes back to him, when they corrected the name, he wrote back to him, Hitpalalti ba'ad Rivka bat Sarah. They confused who's the mother and who's the daughter. I prayed for Rivka bat Sarah v'nei neiti. And I got answered. She's going to be better. What we will think. That was Rav Kivega's koach but also his care and compassion for people. Now, I don't know, Lema say, you know, today people have so many names and nicknames and this and that. It's very complicated, by the way, in Alakha, what's called the name, what's not. So I'm not sure what that means on a spiritual level. What, Hashem doesn't know who the person is? I don't know. There's a big sugya. Many, many of the poskim, beginning from the Rishonim already, discuss this, why it's so important to have the right name exactly of somebody who's not well when you pray for them. Not so simple. By the way, that's why we use a mother's name, not a father's name, because the Gemara says the mother, we know for sure who it is, the father, we don't know for sure. And as a result, that's why we pray for a sick person, we use a mother to make sure we have the name right. In the Sephardic world in general, we use the mother's name for almost everything. Um, no, so that's Koach HaTfilah, and that's also the commitment of Rabbi Kivega towards bettering the situation of those who are suffering from a medical uh, situation. Um, but why did he do this? And if the idea was to do chesed, there are many other ways that he could do chesed too. Am Kivega was known for his chesedim. This was where he put, seems to be, put a lot of emphasis on, definitely for one lo- period of his life. Why dafka this mitzvah? The many other mitzvot. Uh, why didn't he get busy with achnasat kala? It's a big mitzvah. One of the, it's a mitzvah parallel in the way the Mishnah terms it, the Ushalmi, I mean, terms it. Uh, to Biku Cholim. So where, where was the passion for the Biku Cholim part of it? More than that, it's extremely time-consuming. He went physically to the hospital, as we said, uh, very time-consuming. Prayed for each one. Takes a lot of his time that he could have been learning. So what... Uh, and Rav Kivega was a busy man. Just a, a self-description of Rav Kivega about himself that he writes in the Tshuva in Ma'adua Tanina Sivan Tedvav um, is... That the extent of his tildotav, meaning his obligations and how busy he was, uh, went up. Uh, it's a description. It's a, a, a term, a description term. Went up above his neck, meaning he's drowning in how busy he is, and uh, to the point that it affected his strength. That it affected his health. He became weak from it. So he was beyond busy, and. This rabbi that was a gaon olam and beyond busy and had so many tildot, that tildot means from the cloud, question stands, so that's all the chuvot he wrote, which is only a fraction of what he really wrote. These are the ones that we have that were printed over the years. Um, Pick this mitzvah biku chalim and put a big emphasis on it. Um, also there's a lashon in the chuva that godel chul the great, the great amount of weakness and v'rosho ve'ivarav kvedim alav, his head and his hands are heavy on it, meaning we, we would call that a chronic migraine. Um, that he has tons of different struggles medically. Um, so, here Kivega describes about himself, that he's weak, he's not well himself, as a result of all the stress that he has um, from obligations towards people and towards his own self-created obligations, his learning commitments and other things. You know, the Dolim viewed it as debts. There's a very known story, sidetracking for a second. Uh, Chaim Kanievsky married off his last child. So when he was sitting by the wedding, and waiting, you know, normally he wouldn't sit for long, but it was his own child, so he had to be by the wedding. 
and he, uh, he didn't look so happy. Now, it's a very happy night. And so it's mechutan, meaning the, fa the other fa father came over to him and said, uh, Rabbi, what, uh, it's a happy night. Huh? He said, yeah, it's a happy night, but I have such chovot, I have so many debts because of it. So he took it literally that, uh, you know, Chaim doesn't have money, and weddings cost a lot of money, especially in Israel to buy an apartment or whatever. And, and he felt terrible that because, of, you know, he's paying for half. He should have paid for the whole thing because of his, he only paid for half, so now Chaim has debts and it's affecting him. So he tells him, don't worry about it, I'll pay, all the chavot, I'll pay everything here. Now you have no more chavot. And if you have any other ones from before, then tell me, I'll take care of it. So Abchayim started laughing. So he says, what's so funny? So he said, not chovot like that. He says, I have a, a commitment to learning. You know, Abchayim learns eight, blood, eight dapei gemara every day, plus a few dapei min Yerushalmi, plus, plus, plus. You know, there's a long list of commitments that he has. He says, and now with the wedding, so the whole evening, I wasn't able to learn. So now I'm in big debt. I, what am I supposed to do? I'm behind on my learning to such an extreme. That was the Gdolei Yisrael's idea of uh, so Rav had all these self-created -com commitments to how much he's going to learn and the quota and the, how many chuvot he's going to write and everything else. And He writes about himself that it affected his health that, uh, you know, to such an extent that it, it, it took a toll on him. <laughs> so, why did he choose this mitzvah of Yikuch Olim? So comes Rav Kivega and writes that when I go into the hospital, and I see this one is sick, with his examples are one with his, this one with his lungs, and this one with his kidneys, and this one with his liver. It seems like those were the common illnesses that they treated in the hospital he established. When I leave, I understand how much gratitude I have to give Hashem, how thankful I have to be to God. That I have a headache or migraines, but uh, not, not this. And then he says, and when I say the prayer, Eivarim shepilagta banu v'ruach unshama shenafachta ba'apeinu, the limbs that you gave us and the soul, the life that we have, it's a whole different prayer already. It brings me to the realization of how much I have to be grateful for. Who's saying this? Not today, somebody who made a bracelet, thank you, Hashem. And charged you for it. Uh, thank, thank you, Chase Bank, that's what I really should say. Um, something else completely. The Gaon Olam, Abki Vege, Kola Torah Kula, Balpeh, everything. He lived Torah completely, A to Z. He's saying that even he needed that wake up call. It's disrespect to even say that about Abki Vege, but he said it about himself, so I'm just quoting. Even he needed that to strengthen his gratitude that he has to Kadosh Baruch Hu. Even he needed it. And that's why he, it was so important to him, Dafka this mitzvah, and he put such an emphasis on this mitzvah. Now it's known from Avitzel Blaza Zitzal Zchtoyagin Aleinu that he said about his Rebbe, Avisel Salanta. It's put down in the Sefer Amichtavim, Peitet. Mishalora'a Bechodesh Elul. Mishalora'a Bechodesh Elul. Somebody who didn't see Avisel Salanta in the month of Elul. Lora'a Imata Dina Amitit Miyamav. He never saw what it means to fear judgment in his life. In the same altar from Slabot, Kelim also said, Rabitzele and Etivot O, Samachalef, don't think that I'm such a genius and know all the sources like that by heart. I get a lot of help, Baruch Hashem. There's all different rabbis that over the years, you know, quoted different things, so I got access to them. Amongst them, a rabbi that I like a lot, I, uh, using a couple of sources that he quoted, Rabbi and Taisig, I've used them in the past, uh, his information in the past. Brilliant, Tamit Chacham, who knows a ton of things in the Agada, and other things as well, but also in the Agada, which is more rare. And uh, it's very helpful. Um, so Abitzel in the Tivot Tosa Mechalaf says uh, that you saw Salanta the whole week would be on his own in, uh, uh, I don't know what to call it, I guess the same idea as the way we have upstate New York that some people go to in the summer or whatever. Um, so there was a small town near where he lived, near where Abitzel's home was. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it properly, so I'm not going to make a fool out of myself. Um, and uh, it was near Kovner. And he used to stay there during the week. A, a Litvisher version of Itbodidut. Yeah. We'll call it that. Um, and once a week, his students would go 
see him over there. Um, and when they would come see him, this was during the month of Elul we were talking about. So they would come before Mincha, then he would greet them, then they would pray Mincha. And after Mincha he would put on a talit, and that's a, that was a form of a respect thing. And he would uh, give a speech of Musar, Rabbi Shalom the founder of the Musar movement. And the description of Rabbi Tzalat, the student, about his Rebbe's once a week Musar speech after Mincha was that uh, it would be Bibchiyot Tatsumot with great tears. And he would talk from the heart, great tears. Beat Pa'alut Tatsuma with a, bit, a great awe. Ad asher namasli beinu, until our hearts melted. He had a huge impact on his students, this once a week speech that he would give to them after Mincha. One week they came, one of the years, to see the Rebbe. Now they're used to the routine. We come, there's Mincha, after Mincha, there's a, a speech that uh, gives them the big chizuk for the week, and then they leave. And they show up, and there's no Mincha, there's no nothing. Then he tells them, you know, let's pray Mincha, they pray Mincha, and now they think they're routine, right? He's going to put on his talis and they're going to have the speech. And there's no talis and no speech. And he tells them that uh, we're going to go on a walk a little bit instead. Bishol Salanta was, you know, the Tenuata Musa. Today there's nothing left of it, but, uh, you know, we're not a generation that's capable of dealing with that. It's the way. But in those days they were stronger. Um, so going on a walk in Elul, uh, that, that wasn't Rabbi Yisrael. Okay, but he, the Rabbi says, what do you do? So he took them on a walk, and he took them on a walk, and the destination wasn't the lake or the river or the beach or whatever. He took them on a walk to the local hospital, the city hospital. And he went around with his students following him and started asking the doctors, and what, what, what's this person sick with, and how's he doing, and what's the prognosis, and... Same thing, one patient to the next. Um, and he made the doctors give him great details, not just a general, has this illness. All the details of the illness, what it does, and how much the person suffers from it, and why, and what's the cure, and is the cure painful or not, and is there a chance to cure, or there's no chance to cure. Like this, digging into the tiny details of every situation, as if he was going to study medicine now. This is El by Rabbi Shol. This is definitely out of character. This is not Rabbi Shol and El at all. The whole thing didn't add up. But the doctors had respect for him. So they explained to him about lung diseases. They explained to him about this. They explained about that. You know, they gave him all the graphic details about everything. And then they, he would hear the people you know, screaming in pain and suffering. This was before the days of strong pain meds like we have today. And so the suffering was to the full extent. There was a big... Uh, it was a big tsar, no, but kids, it wasn't simple at all. It wasn't simple at all. And then the, but so the students saw what was going on at the same time. Then they left. When they left, they were sure. So now he's going to give a speech at least, right? They came all the way for that. This is the weekly. And we saw, looks at them and said, no, let's daven Maariv. Let's pray Abi. So at that point, they couldn't stay quiet anymore. So. They turned to him and said, Rebbe, wait, but what's with the speech? What's with the speech? That's what we came for. We came to hear. What's, what, what happened? What's with the speech? So Rabbi Shol t- told him these words. This is Rabbi Itzel saying about his Rebbe. He said, could there be a bigger Musa speech in the world than what you just witnessed walking around in the hospital? Is there any bigger Musa class in the world that I could give you? The, what could I add? There's nothing that I could possibly add. He said, and then he elaborated. He said, when a person realizes to what extent all his limbs and everything about him, anything physical about his body, is 100% in Hashem's hands, and without Hashem, God forbid, it could be very different, and it doesn't have to work properly, and there could be so many different illnesses and problems as a result, then he understands also what the Navi Yeshaya says, Almi batachta ki maradabi. Who do you have faith in? Meaning Hashem saying, not him. Ki maradabi that you rebelled against me. Who do you think would do a better job than me? 
that you went to somebody else instead of to me. Yeah, that and and that's and 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 that's the uh, biggest musa in the world. And then Rishal concluded and he said, and also now you know how much and what you have to be grateful for. No. So we say in the prayer, right? Even if our mouth would be filled with song like the ocean and kids, all different descriptions, we'd never be able to thank Hashem even for even a microscopic number of, uh, of, what, of all the good that a person has to be thankful for. And that's why David HaMelech says, the Chavat Al-Vavod brings us down in a whole piece where he talks about how thankful a person has to be. David HaMelech says in Tilim Lamed Hey Yud, Kol Atzmotai Tomarna Hashem Mikamocha. All my bones, and bones is not a, a parable, it's literal. The fact that I have bones, that alone says, Hashem Mikamocha, God, who's like you? And Lahav Dilalaf Afei Avdalot, medicine advanced a lot. So you just look what there was available 50 years ago, not even so long ago. And look at today. Yes, COVID threw the world a little bit off and made us lose trust in the medical system. That was an Amuna wake up call, probably. But uh, medicine advanced to the point that they already had discussions about if it's ethical or not to clone man. Cloning, right? The famous cloning discussion back in the 90s. Um, we came a long way. It's amazing what today people can do. There are medical professionals that can save lives in ways that didn't exist. An interesting Psaq Halakha. Again, I'm not saying this for everybody, I don't know, but I've heard this multiple times from Chaim Greneman, who was a Talmud Muvak of the Chazonish Zitzal, and pretty much everything he said was always quotes from the Chazonish. Chaim Greneman, besides being Gaon Olam in Torah, was also a Gaon Olam in medicine. He understood medicine in ways that the biggest doctors had no understanding of. And in Israel, people would go ask him medical questions, and he would call the doctor and tell the doctor what to do. He wasn't a, medic, a, a licensed doctor, but he understood the dynamics of medication more than the doctors did, so he would guide the doctors how to treat their own patients, and the doctors respected him, even the non-religious ones in Israel, because they couldn't argue with his brilliance. It was, it was just simply brilliant. And at Chaim Greinemann, when people would consult with him on what to do with this illness, with that illness, so he would give advice, and when it came to cardiac issues, he would do a lot of the diligence on the patient's condition, more than other things, and primarily for the purpose of coming out with one outcome. Is the procedure that has to be done, which he knew what had to be done, urgent? Or if we wait a year, it won't make a difference, and the person's not at risk, and it won't harm him. There's certain things, let's say a person has a God which you never know, a leaking valve. So if it's not leaking a lot, then even if it's not done, fixed right away surgically, it's not, uh, it, doesn't risk a it doesn't risk a person so much. Now, this wasn't medical advice. I give a disclaimer. I know we should get any ideas in there. Every person should go to his cardiologist and ask him in every situation individually, and God forbid, nobody should ever have that problem. But there are many cardiac issues that we know one day they'll have to be treated, but right now, it's perfectly safe to leave a person the way he is. So, in situations like that, where he found that something could be treated today, but it doesn't have to be treated today, in every other illness, he would say, treat, why wait? Go do whatever, it is. here's what to do, and go do it. Here's a good doctor, here's the treatment. And when it came to cardiac issues, he would say, wait. So, on more than one occasion, I asked him, Rabbi, what's the difference? When we come to you with this condition, which technically is even less dangerous, uh, you send the doctor right away and get it done. And when people come to you with certain cardiac issues that aren't urgent, again, I stress, that aren't urgent and won't affect the person negatively if it's lit, you push them off. So he told me a very interesting thing. He said that cardio is the area in medicine, at least it was, but I think it still is until today, that advances the quickest, that evolves the quickest. Being the difference in treatment and the new inventions in, in many areas. If any of you are a doctor, a nurse, or, an R, or anything in the middle, PA or whatever, NP, then I'm sure you know this. Um, it's one of the fast, fastest evolving areas in medicine for many, many years already. It's not a new thing. So, uh, years upon years. Yeah, so in a regular sickness, even if it's not pressing for today, the probability of something better or a better way to treat it coming out in three months from now or in six months from now when it will have to be treated 
it's almost zero. So why wait? to take care of yourself. And Hashem gave permission to a doctor to heal, and therefore go get, the, go get it taken care of. But in an area that in six months from now, it could be they'll have such a better way of going about things that the current treatment won't be necessary. And the greatest example is many evasive procedures that had to do with the heart that we used to do years ago. Today we do without opening up the person. Many. Uh, so why should the person go put himself into a sakona of a complicated surgery when it could be in a few months from now he won't need that surgery and he'll be able to be done in a better way, in a, more, in a less evasive way. And it's not dangerous for right now. That's the doctor's clearly saying. Go wait. So if it go wait, let's wait and see if something better develops. It's an interesting attitude that he had to stop just to understand the way Gedolim thought beyond what we... Uh, but that's... Uh, that's just the flesh and blood. So with all science advancements, scientific advancements, and with how much we advance in the medical world, there's one area that we did, never advanced in, never made any accomplishment towards. To generate life from its core, we have no way of doing. We could repair a person's heart, even put a new one in, transplant. We could, we could do a lot of great things. Save people's lives right and left in all different ways. But to create the origin of life from zero, that medicine was never able to do. And they never will be able to do it, by the way. Because that's a yesh me'ayin, that only Hashem could do. When a person sees himself, meaning his life, and sees that the origin is eternal, by definition, even from a scientific basis, kol atzmotai tomar na Hashem Then his bones, his flesh and blood says, there's a rabbinish lelem, Hashem ikamoch, God, there's nobody like you. Nope. Based on this, listen to the amazing story. The Kolarye, Zechat Salik Kolshi Vacha, Sotoyegin Aleinu, was Talmid of the Chatam Sofer. And once he went, he traveled a long way to go see the Tanz Rebbe, the Divechai Mitzanz. He went to see the Divechai. He didn't go alone, alone, I mean. He went with his kabayim and a couple of students. They made a joint journey to go see the Divichayim. When they got to the Divichayim, so this was after a couple of days of a travel, it was before the days of cars, so uncomfortable. And in the language of the poskim, it's called Tiltulei Aderech. It's a quote from Chazal, actually. The burden of the way. I mean, the travel was very draining, very tiring, very hard. So they go a couple of days traveling, they get, finally get to the Divichayim, that was the goal, to go see the Divichayim, right? So they were, the students were assuming they're gonna stay there for a week or two. Uh, you don't make such a big effort to, for nothing, yeah. Obviously, you must wanna, the Kolai must wanna spend time with the Divichayim. They walked in, and the Divichayim had just come out of the bathroom. He washed his hands, they were waiting for him. And he started to say, Asher Yatsar. Came out of the bathroom, he washed his hands, and said, Asher Yatsar. And he said, yes, Asher Yatsar, with so much kavana, with so much excitement, that his face looked like it was on fire, like bright red, like a flame. And he was banging with one of his feet to keep his concentration. The Dirichayim was a big ilui. To the point that his foot started bleeding from banging so hard, so long. And as Asher Yatsar took over an hour, He finished saying Asher Yatzah, the Kolari who just traveled a few days with his students to see the Divichayim. Went over to the Divichayim, said hello, told the students, let's go into the carriage and we're going back home. The students didn't understand. <laughs> they, they just didn't understand. That, uh, so the Gabite said, Rebbe, that's what we did this whole long journey for, to say hello and to turn around and go back. So the Kolai told him, he missed the whole point. The story is what down in the Sefer called Yisrael Saba, in the fourth, in the fourth volume. He said, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll quote the words of the Sefer, Ra'ita ech yesh levarech bracha zu. You just learned, you just saw how you have to make this blessing of Asher Yatzel. V'day li v'kach. That alone is enough. K'sha'ashrish bekirbi hasaga zu that I'll root, in root deep in me. This thing that I learned, 
Of what kavana you have to say, Asher Yatsa. Avolo, Sif, Lumod. So now do I have anything else to come and learn? I just learned the most important thing. So that's it. Mission accomplished. Time to go home. Unbelievable thing. Years later, the Kolai got very sick. And he had an abdominal illness that caused him terrible su suffering. Now, abdominal illnesses can cause terrible suffering. Nobody should ever know. Today, for example, one of the common ones, unfortunately, is Crohn's disease. God should watch us all. Um, and those who aren't well should have a watch them, because it's very unpleasant, to put it mildly. And, but the Gemara already describes that Rebbe, for a lot of years, had a sickness. You know, and Chazal says, Hashem had a Tana on him, that he didn't respect the life of animals enough. Um, and the... Uh, the Gemara describes that Rebbe's abdominal illness, whatever it was, it doesn't say what his sickness was, was so painful that he used to yell from pain. And he, Rebbe at the time lived in Sipoli, in a town called Sipoli. And when he would scream from pain in Sipoli, his pain was so great that his, scream, his yell was so loud that shipmasters, captains of ships that were in the middle of the ocean, we're able to hear the voice of Rabbi screaming in pain. That's the Gemara's way of describing how much suffering could be from abdominal pain. So the Kolai had a terrible abdominal illness uh, at one, uh, a few years after this incident. And then, Benise Nisim, Hashem made him a miracle, Baruch Hashem went away and he felt better after a while. And when he felt better, he spoke to his students and he told them, now I understand why the Tzanz Rebbe had such a great Avodah when he said the blessing of Asher Yatza. So until now I never appreciated what it means to have a healthy gastro system. Now that I understand the extent of the pain of having an unhealthy gastro system, I finally understand why the, the, there was such a great Avodah of the Tzanz Rebbe and the blessing of Asher Yatza. And there's a known saying amongst people that is a lesson that has to be learned. And the saying goes like this. When somebody's finger hurts, so his whole mind is in his pain from his finger. And it's uh, very annoying. Even on something as dumb as a paper cut, it's, right? Suddenly that's all you think about for the next two hours. And if God forbid somebody has an illness, especially if it's a, a, se a severe illness, so of course that's all that's on his mind all day. What doctor, what treatment, what this, what that. he's suffering greatly. You know? And besides the doctors and treatments, where ma'aminim b'nei ma'aminim, he knows that he has to go to Rafei Cholasau, so he prays and prays and prays and prays. No. And if his prayers were answered and the, pray and the illness went away and his finger's no longer hurting, or whatever, or kavachoma if it's even worse, what happens a few days later? He forgets that he even has a finger. Wait a second, just a few days ago you were crying your heart out that you think it shouldn't hurt. What happened? But that's the nature of a person. That's the nature of a person. So Gashboku says, why does your finger have to hurt for you to remember that I gave you a finger? Many people took great losses in life. And I'm not only talking about money. Losing loved ones, losing relationships, losing other things. And spiritually the reason why it happened was because they didn't understand to appreciate what they had when they had it. So I shouldn't have to take it away, so they realize what they had. It's a very frightening thought, by the way. It's known from the Yisod Vishor Shavodah, he used to snuff tobacco. And uh, before, he would say, I wanted to say the example of smoking cigarettes, but I know today it's controversial. Some people say that you're not allowed to smoke cigarettes, it's unhealthy, whatever, so I don't want to upset anybody. But uh, tobacco, that was what he was used to do. Uh, before every, you know, see, that's an easier example. I say before every puff, he used to say a prayer. Thank you, Master of the World. I thank you. That you invented the tobacco and that you gave me a nose that I'm able to snuff the tobacco. If we really lived with Hashem, now these are very high levels, and uh, I don't expect anybody to be there, but at least you should be aware that it exists. That not only will we say shakol before we drink a cup of water, well, water is only if you're thirsty, so a cup of coke, um, 
we would first say a separate prayer. Thank you, Hashem, that you created Coke. Thank you, Hashem, that you gave me a mouth. Now with COVID, we understand. Thank you, Hashem, that my taste buds work, that I could taste. And then, thank you for giving me the Coke. That's the Shah Kol already, that you created everything and that I could have. How many things have to work combined in order for it to be? Right? And in my example of Coke, so we also have to say thank you that I'm not overweight and I don't have to be on a diet. And then, uh, and then, then the list goes on. And then I don't have problems with my teeth, so I don't have to avoid sugar, and, and so on. La Maisa, no? 99 cents from 7 Eleven, sip, and goodbye. Seems very simple. Now you don't even have. Right? We're becoming a cashless world, so you don't even pay with money. You just you used to be you had to swipe your credit card. That also became too hard for society. So you tap your credit card, so you don't even feel like you did anything. Yeah. It's all the it's her. Because if you had to make an effort for what you enjoy, then you would realize you would have a few extra seconds. So you would realize that Hashem's giving you a gift. Because everything comes effortless, so we don't even have the chance to realize that everything we have is a gift. When the Yisod V'Shol Shavoda in a sefer called Shah Maim, which the whole sefer was written about the Inyanim of Tshuva in the month of Elul, describes different things that have to do with Tshuva. He writes, Maim. My eyes have tears pouring out of them. Why? Shereshita Tshuva. The first thing that a person has to do Tshuva on, what will we say? Not keeping Shabbat, not eating kosher. Huh? There's a long list of things, maybe that we could think of. It doesn't quote any of those as the first thing. The first thing that a person has to do tshuva on is that he either doesn't make bekot anayinim or he makes them but without kavana. First thing on the list. And then he goes on by Ichut to explain how severe it is. Now I don't like saying scary things, definitely not at night. So in a hinting way, in the Sefer Hasidim, at the end of Siman Memvav, you can look it up yourself if you want the graphic details. He brings down a story about somebody who passed away and then came in a dream, whatever it is, and they asked him what happened over there in, in the world upstairs. The punchline is, I'm skipping a lot of the details because, again, I don't like saying scary things. Definitely not at night and definitely not the young people. Uh, but the punchline was is that he said that the most severe thing that they judged him for wasn't all his sins. It was whether he said thank you for the food he has. That was the number one thing that Hashem demanded for him. What's Pshat in this? What's Pshat in it is we started off saying that in order to go on a journey, you have to have a motivation. You know the biggest motivation to be on a journey to success in life is? To realize that the fact that you're alive and you're able to go on the journey is the greatest blessing ever. That is the number one motivation that you could have. I'm here and I'm able to go on the journey. Just that alone is the biggest push to be successful. It's the biggest push to want to be a better person spiritually, physically, financially, every way. The number one push that exists. It's an unbelievable thing. We don't think about it a lot, but uh, it's an unbelievable thing. So. And we see clearly. So the Shosh it says, That's the Kara Tshuva, the main Tshuva in Elul, is on this subject. By the way, the Likute Remal, from the Tzadik Ramayisha Leib Misasov, Zechet Tzadik Levacha, when he writes about himself, it is obviously in his great Anava that he had. He writes, Mi Ani Akaton Shabaktanim, who am I, the small of the small, the smallest person. Me Olam Lo Yareti Mipnei Adonai Adonim, I never had Yerat Shamayim. Alavai, we should have when we're 120 on our deathbed, one billionth of the Yirat Shamayim that Moshe Leib Sasev had. Halavai. Uh, you're not going straight to Gan Eden. They can create a new Gan Eden for you. That's how big of a Gan Eden you're going to need. And he writes about himself, Mi Ani, who am I? I never had Yirat Shamayim. When he describes what it means that he never had Yirat Shamayim, that if not only for this sin, that he says Me'abrachot every day. That's a red. <laughs> Otherwise, we could all say that we say Me'abrachot every day. That would be a nice start. Without the fear of Hashem, 
אשר בעוונותיי הרבים, דרו מי גרייט סינס, אני מכיס להשם יתברך, היה בסדר להשם יתברך, ברוך הוא ברוך שמו, מאה פעמים בכל יום, a hundred times every day. אוי לי ואוי לנפשי, that's how he ends that peace. Vote to me and vote to my soul. Unbelievable thing. I'm telling you, I, I also have to work on this. It's a... Uh, sometimes you go to a restaurant, you eat for two hours, but the blessing is not even two seconds, and then you're not even sure when you left if you said it or not. Did I say Bikat HaMazon? What does it mean, did I say Bikat HaMazon? You should say, did I eat? That would be okay. But did I say Bikat HaMazon? Rabbi Zinkanievsky once told me that Abhaim doesn't know what he's eating. It's not, it uh, doesn't make a difference to him. He eats to be healthy, he trusts the people around him, they give him food to be healthy. But he knows if he ate or not. How does he know if he ate? He says, my husband's able to, he's able to go days without eating also. His whole head is in learning, he doesn't feel it. He said because he keeps a very stringent calculation of a every day. So he knows how many blessings were given to him that day, so he knows by default if he ate anything or not. He's missing blessings, so that means they didn't bring him his anot today, they didn't bring Shrakot today. So she told me, interesting way of analyzing things. We know this restaurant opened up, that one opened up, the other one opened up. This, in this place they have a better steak, in this place they have a... That's what we know. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. Hashem gave us things to enjoy, that's fine. Assuming it's kosher. But uh, he knows there wasn't his or there wasn't his anot today. That's, that, that's what he knows. It was the best, it was. No, the kids are, but uh, to go into this attitude of superficial thank yous, uh, that not only Hashem doesn't want, there's a slap in his face. Don't say thank you if you don't mean it. That's why you have to embed it in yourself. Why did Chazal put such an emphasis on Me'a Bochot? Because Me'a Bochot is a hundred times a day that a person trains himself that you have to be thankful for every breath you take. It's a self-training thing that has no end. I've seen people, not only in the religious world, and not only in the Jewish world, I've deal by the Goyim also, not a lot, but some, that actually keep diaries, not of what their mood is and how they're feeling. Uh, get over it, as they say. About all the things that they have to be thankful for. And some people can't do all the things, the five things, ten things, whatever, there's different... Uh, there are many, many studies, by the way, that people that suffer from chronic depression, if they keep a journal of 10 things that they have to be thankful for every day for the, a period of time, it's argued how long that period is, but it's not that long, it's anywhere between 30 and 90 days, they beat, naturally, their depression. Tons of studies that prove it. Because a person suddenly learns a real value to life. And now it's not only a real value to life, that doesn't take away from all our struggles. Yeah, we have tons of struggles and tests and suffering. And Hashem, yeah, how we should be in a, an end to this already, but uh, in a happy way. Sheikh should come, people shouldn't suffer anymore. But again, this is our point. It gives you a, a reason to stay on the journey, to stay on the path. And when you're on the path, A, you're already a success as we proved right at the beginning. And B, besides, Chazal say, right, Rashi says over there by Rachel married of Akiva, even though he didn't know how to learn or anything, just because he committed that he was going to go learn Aleph Beis. Because Rashi writes that the derech is, the way he is, somebody that goes to learn Torah, so he becomes an Adam Gadol. Comes to Tamit Chacham. The derech is when a person has a motivation, an incentive to have a relationship with God, he becomes the Yerush Shemaim. He becomes, something becomes of him. So the Maaseh, if we had to summarize, Chazal talk about, uh, based on the Pasuk, Varim Yud, Per Yud, Pasuk Bet, Vata Yisrael, Ma Hashem Lokecha, Shoel Mi Yimach, Ki Im Lira, Et Hashem Lokecha. This is a Pasuk that's talking about Tshuva. What does Hashem ask of you? Ki Im Lira, Et Hashem Lokecha, Da Yishev Yad Shamayim. So Chazal are now, Gmarah Menachot Mem Gimel Amud Alef, Amud Bet, sorry. Menachot Mem Gimel Amud Bet. The Gmarah learns out, Al Tikri Ma Ela Mea. Mam, don't read it ma, mem hey, ela mea, add in an aleph, a hundred. And from there the Gemara learns that a person has to, from Mikan, from here we learn that a person has to say a hundred bachot every day. Um, no. 
What do we see from here? That in the psukim that talk about getting close to Hashem and Shuvah, the description is of the Torah and the psukim, the way Chazal and the psukim, is to say a hundred brachot. Meaning to be a thankful person. We envision tshuva either as a joke, God forbid, or as something extreme. I don't know, uh, doing Tani Tibur for 40 days and jumping off the bridge. Or I don't know, you know, going to the mikveh 84 times and going this and doing that. Uh, that has nothing to do with tshuva. That has to do with OCD. And for that, there's doctors that treat it. And Chazal described tshuva, so the shorish, the source of tshuva is being a thankful person. Thankful person is about tshuva. Somebody who's not thankful is not about tshuva. Missing the point. The way Chazal teaches us is we have to be modea la'aval, thank for the past, and pray for the future. We learn that from Le'ah, that she stopped having kids. So the Ramban writes that uh, because she said, now I'll thank God, but she didn't say that Hashem should give me more. So Hashem said, okay, you said thank you, that's beautiful, that means you have enough, so we don't have to give you anymore. So we always have to know how to thank, and Hashem shall help further. That's why the Nusuch Bikat Amazon is based, is based on that. That's why, for example, Shmon Esri has that, on one end we're very thankful, and other things, and the praise of God, and many other parts of it. And then there's a whole list of requests as well. Because we're modea la'ava, we think on the past, and then we pray for the future. A close friend of mine, this story became very famous a bunch of years ago, but uh, I'm telling it to you firsthand, went into a Michal Yehuda Lefkowitz, Echet Tzadik V'Kadosh Livacha, from the Asher Shivel to Panovich Akhtana. He was a guy, that Tzadik is still alam, gone alam, there's no way to describe. And he asked the Michal Yehuda, it was a few days before Shana, he was a big time at Chacham. Call us to him, big time at Chacham. He said, Rabbi, it's a new year and that, it's a customary to take on something new. I want to take on something new for the new year. What do you think I should take on? Give me an etzer. Give me advice of what I should take on. Now we're talking about a person who, on his own merit, is a huge Talmud Chacham, who was going into one of the Gdolei Israel at that, that time. And the Chayyudah left. What would you expect? I don't know. I would expect to add an hour learning. I don't know if that was possible, because he probably learned as many hours as there were in a day, but whatever, in theory. Maybe to daven with the Kavanot, to the Ari, or the Rashash, I mean. Maybe they, I don't know, to go to the mikveh every day, so many things. Mechidah told them, the first thing you should take upon yourself is that you're not going to take upon yourself anything big. Because my experience shows me whoever took anything upon himself any big change, it never lasted. It's true. That's the Yitzhah's trick of Shana Kippur. Somebody gets up, a good rabbi, and he gives a firing speech before Tkiyot, or by Nihila, and everybody in the room promises that they're becoming the next Rav Shach. And that doesn't even last until Chazarat Hashatz. Because it's not realistic. So, so the first thing you should take upon yourself is that you're not going to take anything big upon yourself. That's number one. Number two, if you want an eight, so what specifically? So his words were, take upon yourself that Asher Yatzar shouldn't be Tfilat Aderech. What does that mean? Most people walk out of the bath and they say Asher Yatzar. But they're on the go, right? We're going somewhere. So while well, they're going down the stairs in the elevator and that, so they start the bracha by the outside of the bathroom and they end the bracha in their car. That's normal, right? That's common practice. Maybe we could even be a baditcha, uh, like the baditcha Rebbe, and say something beautiful about that. Mika and Chaisal, even in the elevator, they're saying brachot. Unbelievable. But in reality, that's tefillat aderech. You're on your way and you're saying uh, prayers. So take upon yourself that whenever you say Asher Yetzal, you do it in one stationed place. Now, when I heard this, it wasn't when it happened. I heard it years later. The guy told it to me like this. He said, and I took it upon myself. But I took it upon myself feeling like cheap. Like, really? That's all I'm taking upon myself? He said, until I started. And it was one of the hardest Kabbalot I ever took upon myself. And I didn't understand that Rabbi Chiyuda in one sentence could tell me, don't take upon yourself anything big and then tell me this. <laughs> Sounds so simple, no? Sounds like the easiest thing to do. Try it. <laughs> I tried it. It's not easy at all. 
you know, if you last, God bless you. But I, I, I'm not, uh, I don't know, I'm a Chidus Torah enough to know the way he thinks. I wish I did, maybe one day I will. But based on what we said, it's very simple, I told him that. Because that's a blessing of thanks. Thank you that you're healthy. If a person puts focus on a blessing of thanks, of gratitude, thanking God that his body is functioning properly, after that everything follows. Then he's on the path to be as successful as could be because if he has who to be thankful for, then he has who to show appreciation to and the list goes on, it's very obvious on its own. Because Rokh should help that we should join this journey. And I really advise it, by the way, if anybody's capable, it's a good idea. It's a, it's a very, very good idea. Besides, I don't know, in the Zgula books, there's all different stuff about it. Uh, I'm not a big Zgula man, but uh, today people need Zgula, so what should we do? We'll give it to them. Um, there's many. Definitely when it comes to health-related matters, about people that took upon themselves to say Asher Yatsa properly, and a lot of the health-related matters went away. I know a lot of stories like that about that people told me. I don't know personally, but I know people told me over the years all different stories like that. Um, but that's not the reason to do it. The reason to do it is because it's the right thing. And for somebody who doesn't know Hebrew so well, and this, that, I'm not saying a psak halacha, I'm just giving you an attitude. Now, the, the technicalities in halacha, ask your local rabbi how to, uh, So, no, I don't know, maybe if you can't say it in Hebrew, you don't want to say that, but at least know to say thank you, at least that much. A lot of times I go to colleges, whatever, they have Jewish students, but they, they never even learned all of it. Uh, so to tell them to say, Bukota Neinim, it's not realistic until we first teach them all what, you know, how to read and how to say Hebrew and whatever else. And, or at least the English version of all the blessings for them to memorize, at least that. It takes a while. But I want to get the ball rolling so something comes out of it. So I said, just say, thank you God for the food. At least that. It's also a step. Be a person of thanks. Be a person of thanks. Go to sleep at night. Thank you, Hashem. Had a day. Another day to live. It wasn't so good. I had some problems. And this went wrong and that went wrong. Uh, yeah, it's true. It wasn't a great day. But uh, I'm here to say the story and hopefully tomorrow will be a better one. That's Even though the day wasn't great, you're still thankful that you were here for it. And you're praying that tomorrow will be an easier one. You go to sleep with that attitude, you wake up with a much better attitude. And if you build on that day after day after day after day, it makes a difference. You end up becoming something. Coming something doesn't mean to be the next Dola Dola. We should all be, but coming something means that you're a mensch. Something comes out of you. They feel good with yourself. Well, we should help that we should really should get involved, as they say. We should do the right thing and be on the path to true thanks. And, you know, again, not commercial. Don't post on your status, thank you, Hashem, and don't wear costumes to thank you, Hashem. And you don't have to go to thank you, Hashem events. I have nothing against the people that make them, whatever. I'm sure their intentions are very pure and beautiful, and unbelievable. They even provided recently free entertainment with some online concert. My kids were busy for a few hours, so I thank them for that. Uh, but uh, we don't have to commercialize everything. Let's keep our thank yous as an intimate, personal thing. If somebody did you a favor and you go put a big billboard on the highway so writing thank you, so if they're a baby and an attention seeker, so maybe they like that. But most people would be disgusted by it. If you really mean a thank you, call me up privately and just whisper in my ear, thank you. You don't have to make everything into a production. A few less productions would be beneficial. Let's keep this moment of saying thanks to Hashem very personal very intimate moment with God. In our own terms, in our own words, in our own, from the depth of our heart, to have a lot of gratitude to everything. Shem will help. That we be thankful for the beautiful year, the amazing year that we had. That we should have a happier, better, healthier year. Shabbat Shalom.